Welcome to the Justice Committee's 21st meeting of 2018. It's good to see you all back after summer recess. We have apologies from Jenny Gilruth, from Daniel Johnson, and also from Liam Kerr. And we have Michelle Ballantyne attending as a substitute for Liam. So welcome, Michelle. Agenda item number one is our evidence session with the Right Honourable David Mundell, MP, Secretary of State for Scotland. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the meeting, David. Today's session will focus on the potential impact of Brexit on the civil and criminal justice systems and policing in Scotland. The committee will have similar sessions next Tuesday morning with the new Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Lord Advocate. Cabinet Secretary, do you want to make a, a few very brief opening remarks? I am very pleased uh, uh, to do that, convener, and of course I uh, wrote uh, to you uh, setting out a number of uh, publications uh, in particular that uh, um, the government had uh, brought uh, forward in a, uh, the period um, since uh, I was uh, previously due to appear before the committee. And again, my apologies for not being able to appear in June when I was required to give a statement in uh, the, the House of Commons. I look forward to covering a, um, the areas set out in a, um, a, the letter a, uh, and indeed uh, the areas you've set out in your opening remarks and indeed uh, explain some of the work being taken forward by the UK uh, government and how we're co collaborating with the Scottish government and other key stakeholders uh, in Scotland to ensure that the distinct justice system uh, here in Scotland uh, is fully uh, taken into account. I won't uh, rehearse in a um, detail a, um, the the. the uh, publications I set out in um, the letter, but you will be aware that in May and June the UK Government presented proposals for the future security partnership and the future partnership on civil ju judicial cooperation to inform discussion between the UK negotiating team uh, and the EU. And we also published a technical note in May detailing the UK's position on security, law enforcement and criminal uh, justice. In on the 12th of July, we published the white paper setting out uh, our uh, proposals for a future uh, relationship, which included much more detail than the earlier papers on our ambitions for a security partnership, criminal justice cooperation and civil uh, judicial uh, cooperation. Uh, there have also been a series of technical uh, notices uh, uh, published. Uh, the first 25 of those uh, are already uh, in the public domain. The Prime Minister indicated yesterday uh, that there would be approximately uh, 70 of uh, those notices, and one of which will uh, certainly cover the area uh, of a uh, civil uh, uh, of civil law uh, and judicial uh, matters. I, I think a. Um, the rest of uh, the issues uh, that you are likely to want uh, to uh, cover are uh, best taken forward uh, with uh, questions. Uh, and I would, though, put forward uh, one caveat that uh, meant some of the areas, the details of some of the areas, are issues which would more no uh, normally be dealt with my colleagues from the Home Office or a, uh, the Ministry of Justice. So there may be some if there are some very detailed questions, I, I may seek to revert to the committee with written submissions. Uh, thank you for that update and for the letter which you sent um, just uh, giving progress. That was very helpful. Can we move to questions now? And as time is relatively short, if we can have um, brief questions with little preamble and as concise answers as possible, then we'll um, cover as much as we possibly can. And can I start with a very pertinent question about the European arrest warrant? Um, whilst two Russian agents responsible for the Salisbury poisonings can't be extradited, from Russia. If they travel to an EU member state, then they can be brought back to the UK under the European arrest warrant. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that this arrangement will continue, or a similar arrangement will continue, both during the transition period and after the UK leaves the EU? 
I think uh, yes, these events are very uh, uh, pertinent to uh, that question and the consideration uh, of the European arrest warrant. And of course, as you allude to, the Prime Minister made clear yesterday that that was the basis on which uh, we, we are proceeding. So that if these uh, individuals were to leave Russia uh, and to enter into uh, other uh, European uh, uh, jurisdictions, they would be able to be the subject. Uh, of uh, the rest warrant. So we want a, an outcome uh, that will afford the maximum uh, protection to our citizens. Uh, we believe uh, that the uh, current uh, arrangement uh, provides that, and that's why after the uh, implementation period which, in which we would uh, see the existing arrangements uh, continue, uh, we would want uh, to enter into a specific uh, ar uh, and new arrangement with the EU in order that, uh, that we could continue uh, on that basis. Uh, clearly, it, it is subject to reaching uh, agreement, but I think on the basis you know, of recent figures, that it, it's very clear that there are significant benefits for EU member states from uh, maintaining uh, such an arrangement uh, with uh, the UK. Uh, as I understand it, approximately 10,000 uh, individuals in the United Kingdom uh, in the last year were subject to European arrest warrant proceedings, which meant that these people were arrested and returned to EU member states. Uh, we uh, exercised about 1,000 uh, arrest warrants ourselves in, in, in EU member states. So I think there's a mutual, there is a clear mutual benefit for coming to uh, an agreement, and that is our objective. Yeah. Well, certainly the Salisbury case and the two Russian agents put this into very sharp focus. So I suppose it's absolutely being clear that the basis for what effectively might be a new extradition treaty would be just as effective as the EU arrest warrant is operating now. It is, but we want we you know we want to uh, we certainly that that we certainly want to go further than arrangements that would simply be in place if we were a third uh, a third yeah. country. Uh, we want to have uh, an extradition arrangement that is the equivalent of, of uh, the European arrest warrant. There is no reason, uh, operational, legal, uh, why that could not be uh, the case if uh, that can be agreed with a. Uh, the EU. Thank you for that. Rona, did you have a slip the yes, message? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, can I ask you what gap analysis has been done um, if we, we no longer have the European arrest warrant and, you know, has this been shared with the Scottish Government? There's been, uh, obviously, there has been a significant a, um, uh, analysis, significant working with uh, the Scottish Government and indeed the significant working, as you're aware, uh, between uh, the UK police forces, including uh, the uh, Police Scotland, in relation to a number of these uh, these matters. In relation to uh, what would happen if we, uh, in the unlikely event that we leave the EU without a deal, uh, that that is what the technical notice process is, 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 is doing. It's setting out what we envisage happening in those circumstances. But our position is that we see the huge benefits of the European arrest warrant. We want to continue on the same basis. And therefore, uh, that's why we're putting the efforts that we are into securing a security partnership uh, that would yield that outcome. And I know it's the outcome that the Scottish Government uh, want to see. They want to see the, uh, the equivalent of the European arrest warrant being able to continue, and that's what, that's what we want. So that's where the focus of our uh, efforts are, are going. And would that include contingency planning and, and well, there will, Yes, it will. Yes, it, it, it will. And th th there's a, um, discussions ongoing with the Scottish Government about, uh, about contingency planning. But you know, the, the focus uh, and you know, the, the, initial, uh, the initial feedback is, is a positive one, that the EU, see the, the EU member states see the benefit particularly in this area, particularly in, in security matters, uh, in policing and justice matters, of having uh, ongoing cooperation. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, there's a positive environment in which to have 
uh, that uh, negotiation. But I mean, I'm not suggesting that it would be a positive outcome not to have uh, the European arrest warrant uh, a regime. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, exactly the opposite. So just to recap, you said that if there is no um, positive outcome, there is a gap analysis being done and contingency planning? Well, there, 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 there will be contingency planning and there will be uh, most likely what is called a technical notice, which would set out what it is envisaged would happen if there were not to be uh, these uh, existing arrangements. Okay, thank you. John Finney. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Good afternoon, Secretary of State. Um, uh, following on from the convener's questions about the European arrest warrant, and you, you used the term third country status, and there's also discussions about bespoke deals. Um, and, and it's clear that you do want involvement in the European arrest warrant. That's also true of Europol and Eurojust. Yes. Is that the case? Yeah. Yes. Um, the policy paper, Secretary of State, recognises um, that, and I quote here, it's a third country. Uh, that after Brexit, many of the arrangements will not apply or be inferior. That's your own paper. Well, we're seek what we're doing is, is that we're seeking uh, to uh, reach agreement in relation to the, the arrest warrant, in relation to um, engagement uh, with uh, Europol uh, and uh, Eurojust on uh, the best uh, possible basis. Uh, that, that's what we're looking to do. Uh, we don't believe that there is uh, any uh, reason why that, I that, that isn't achieve achievable. I think there is a taking into account and a recognition, particularly within the organisations themselves, of the role that the UK has, has played, uh, and indeed um, Scotland is part of that in terms of our uh, unique uh, uh, civil and criminal justice systems, uh, and uh, particularly you know, in some areas like the level, you know, level of data that we are providing in, in, into Europol. It's, it, it, it's in a completely different uh, domain you know, from, from arrangements that might be made with other third countries, and therefore uh, we, you know, we believe that 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 provides the basis for actually reaching an, an extended agreement, uh, an agreement on an extended basis. Mm -hmm. that, that's certainly a view, Secretary. I accept that. But again, quoting from your own <laughs> policy paper, the existing third country agreements with uh, Europol do not provide direct access to Europol's databases and the streamlined exchange of data. That's a very, very significant resource that's under threat with the present arrangements. It would be if that was if, if we were suggesting that that was the outcome we wanted to achieve. It's not. We want to have a different arrangement from a simple third country arrangement. And for the uh, reasons I set out just in my preceding answer, I, I think that that is a perfectly uh, a practical and credible proposal to make, given the scale of our existing uh, involvement with Europol. I, I'm quoting from your paper, uh, Secretary of State, and, and acknowledge that there is the status quo and the arrangements that apply yes. at the moment. Um, there's a spoke, bespoke deal that you seek, and I mm -hmm. understand that. Mm -hmm. But quite rightly, your poor paper alludes to the potential of being considered as a, a, a third country status. And again, I say that, quoting from your own paper, that would not allow national experts, so UK, both uh, England and Wales, uh -huh. PSNI, and Police Scotland, or indeed mm -hmm. Crown Office Procurator Fiscal People, to be embedded within Europol. Or indeed enable, uh, again quoting from the paper, enable the third country to initiate activity in the same way. That's, that's a very weak situation, isn't it? That's why we don't want to proceed on that basis. That's why we want to secure a security partnership. We believe I, um, that, the, uh, that that is also uh, in, in a, the benefit of the EU and early indications are uh, that you know, we can make positive progress in, in reaching such an agreement. So I, uh, you know, I think it's right you know, to set out what the factual situation is in relation to a third country, but we don't want to be in that position. We want to have that that, as you uh, uh, say, bespoke agreement, and that, that you know, that's what we're aiming to achieve. 
But you'll understand that a, a parliamentary uh, committee, our job is to scrutinise all in, the potential in, outcomes. In, and in, I accept that indeed. you want the desirable outcome. What analysis had been made of the practical implications, for instance, with the exchange of data, were that not to be secured? <coughs> Excuse me. As I've um, indicated, we're in the process uh, of, of uh, producing a series of um, technical uh, notices, and uh, which set out what would happen in uh, um, the eventualities, essentially, of a uh, no deal, and, and uh, data will certainly uh, be covered in. Uh, in, in, in that process, so that there is analysis and work uh, going ahead. And I'm not going to suggest that not reaching an agreement in relation to that uh, you know, would be anything other than suboptimal. It would be. Secretary of State, how many personnel from Scotland, be it Crown Office, Procurator, Fiscal Service or the Scottish Police Service, are embedded in these organisations? I would have to uh, write to you on that, Mr Finney, but I will... Uh, I would to get you the exact uh, number, but I would be happy to do so. Okay, and the roles would be helpful. Yes, so. many thanks. Just on that, um, Cabinet Secretary, I, I think it's it's been suggested it would be very much in the EU's um, interest to have a, a close security partnership because of the sharing of capabilities aspects and expertise. Just now, could you very briefly give the committee a, an understanding of what that is that that gives you the optimism that it would be in the EU's best interest? Well, I, I, I think a cooperation in relation to security matters is clearly in everyone's interest. And you, convener, right at the start of this uh, meeting, re referenced uh, the events on which the Prime Minister made a statement uh, yesterday. That's the world that we're that's the world that we're living uh, in, and it's clearly beneficial for European. Uh, nations uh, to cooperate in, a, uh, uh, for example, tackling uh, the threat that uh, Russia uh, poses in, in that regard. I think, I think that is, that is self-evident at the wider security uh, level. We're also seeing a change in the nature of the threat. We've see, we see all the issues around cyber uh, attacks and the involvement uh, in, in attacks on the democratic uh, process, for for example, uh, you know, and these attacks don't actually uh, just confine to, to geographic uh, national boundaries. So I think the case is overwhelming, but the case is also in the in the numbers I provided at the start in relation just to individual criminal activity. You know, we have uh, uh, supported uh, the use of the European arrest warrant in relation to over ten thousand cases here in the UK for EU for other EU states uh, and, and I think that that you know I, I would hope those states found that that was hugely to their benefit in delivering justice within their own uh, countries Liam McCarthy. Much, um, good afternoon yeah. Secretary of State um, I, I think we would all accept and we heard in evidence earlier uh, in the year about um, the mutual interest there would be in in reaching an agreement. I think the concern is uh, the pathway to getting there. You suggest that a, a failure to, to reach agreement would be suboptimal, which to me um, seems a, a, a rather significant understatement. Um, I, I think the difficulty is that while there is that mutual interest, um, the UK will be out with the structures that allow um, the, the system to operate uh, at present, the Court of Justice being um, but one example. And in terms of the engagement with Europol and uh, Eurojustice, John Finney indicated that the very real and significant difficulties there are in terms of data and evidence sharing, um, I, it's not clear how those are, are to be surmounted. I know the, the, uh, uh, the European Commission back in May uh, rejected the UK proposal for a bespoke data protection regime. So can you give the committee um, some understanding of, of, of what that pathway looks like, how we are going to breach that, uh, uh, that divide that, that, that exists at the moment? There's an ongoing um, negotiation, as, as you know. The EU, uh, you know, the EU wanted the UK um, to set out our uh, proposals, uh, and that's what we've done, both in in the security partnership doc document and uh, the subsequent a uh, white paper. But the ult ultimately, any arrangement uh, that we come to will be one that will be determined 
by the EU member states, not by uh, the Commission. And we have, uh, for example, since uh, over the summer, you know, engaged significantly um, with uh, individual uh, member states. And uh, that's uh, part of what gives us confidence that we will be able to reach an agreement on data and other uh, it matters, but we're in. You know, we are. We are in. You know, we, we are in a negotiation. Part of that negotiation is definitely, uh, as you've uh, alluded to, the conveners alluded to, uh, is to set out to the other side the benefits to them as well uh, as reaching an agreement. But I mean, I, I I'm particularly struck by the level, you know, or the proportion of data which the UK is providing. It's not. It, it, that, that's why it, 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 it's not this, a, to suggest that it is uh, simply a, you know, on the same status as some other uh, third countries. The, there is uh, 40 years uh, of, of uh, history of, of, of data sharing and all uh, the other arrangements that are put in place. The UK has been in the forefront of many uh, of, of initiatives that Europol and uh, other organisations have pursued on the on the justice and security uh, front. So I think we are in, you know, I think we're in a diff we're in a different uh, position uh, from third uh, countries. But I do think we have to make, you know, we have to make our case. This is a negotiation. I, I, I'm I'm sure that. The European Commission will be aware of, of the points you've made in terms of the extent of the data sharing that happens at, at the moment, but nevertheless has, has taken a view that the bespoke proposal um, put forward by the UK Government is, is not adequate. Now, from the discussions that you say are going on at, uh, in EU capitals, are you suggesting that uh, there is a mood amongst the Member States um, to reject um, the advice of the Commission in terms of data sharing? and, and, and Plow on with this bespoke. Uh, with bespoke I'm saying agreement. that. Well, I'm saying that ultimately the agreement, uh, the agreement on uh, this issue and others will be determined by the 27 member states, whether or not on the, you know, whether or not in alignment with the position of the Commission. I would far rather we were in a position uh, where uh, the Commission was also favourable. Uh, to this outcome, and that was clearly in the negotiations uh, that are ongoing by the Secretary uh, of State uh, for DEXU and uh, the Commission and other government officials, we're seeking to make our case uh, with, uh, uh, with the Commission as well. But ultimately, whatever agreements we reach uh, uh, will, with the EU are agreements that are going to be signed off uh, by uh, the 27 member states. There's been no refinement of the of the UK proposal in terms of um, data sharing the, the, since, the, since that commission. The, there have been there have been uh, detailed discussions with the Commission on that issue. Supplementary, though? Yes, it's just following on um, in that same theme. Um, your letter says, um, as a responsible government, we're preparing for all eventualities, including the unlikely scenario in which the current mechanisms we use to cooperate with EU member states are not available when we exit the EU in March 2019. Um, I'm wondering what basis you said uh, the unlikely situation. Is that just wishful thinking? No, I, gen I, I believe that we will be able to reach... Uh, agreement with the EU, and that is a desirable uh, thing to do. We've set out uh, our uh, proposition for those uh, negotiations, and uh, as I, I uh, discussed at length uh, with the Finance and Constitution Committee uh, earlier today, that's the basis on which uh, I want to see us proceed uh, from in our departure. Uh, from the EU, and just to reaffirm a point I made with them, just because contingency arrangements uh, are made in relation to a no deal, because inevitably in a negotiation a no deal outcome is a possible uh, outcome, that is not the outcome that the UK government is promoting. Uh, and uh, we, uh, but we need responsibly. Uh, for some of the issues we've already touched on, to have uh, contingency arrangements in place if it, in, in the, what I do consider the unlikely event it, it uh, emerged. Thank you. Just one other small thing. You have mentioned a few times that technical notices are being drawn up, and I am wondering when you could let us know when they might be issued. There are 25 notices that are already in 
uh, the public uh, domain. Uh, as I said, I am, uh, 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 it's my understanding that there will be uh, a, a one a, uh, covering the um, uh, civil a um, ju um, jurisdiction and, and judicial matters, and uh, imminently, and uh, when particularly when that uh, comes forward, uh, I'll send it directly to the committee. But as they are published, they do come into the public domain. There are about 25 uh, that are currently. Um, in the public domain. The Prime Minister said yesterday she anticipated there might be around 70 of them in total. Okay, thank you. Let's supplementary, Michelle, and then George Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask, are there any areas where you, that you're aware of where the UK and EU security cooperation could actually improve as a result of a new um, relationship? I mean, obviously, a lot of the questions have been about the idea that it's going to be detrimental. Um, so, do you think we could actually enhance Scotland and Britain's combined security capability? Well, as our security uh, cooperation has continued to has continued to develop over the the period, and I think at all points uh, we're seeking to improve it. And our view, you know, is that whether or not we're members of the EU isn't the issue. The you know the issue is ta tackling. Uh, the threats at hand, and that's what we want to, you know, that's what we want an outcome that allows us to do. So I believe, you know, we can continue uh, to uh, improve the process, whether or not we are in, whether or not we're in the EU, on the basis of being able to uh, get the sort of ag agreement that uh, I've referenced in earlier uh, questions. But we've been uh, in the vanguard, in fact, of arguing for things like the passenger uh, name uh, record, the, share, the, the sharing of these lists of, of people who travelled by various uh, means across uh, between countries or across uh, Europe. That was an initiative that the, that the UK pursued. So there are plenty of things that can be done, can continue to be done, you know, whether or not we are actually a member of the EU. OK. George. Thank you, Convina. Good morning. Good, morning. Good afternoon, uh, even. Yeah. Secretary of State, I lose track of time in here myself. But it's on time. I'd like to ask you a uh, question. Just that clock in front of you, and straight in front of you, imagine that's a Brexit clock, and it's got 204 days, which you'll no doubt be aware yeah. there's 204 days to do everything you've mentioned here today. 204 days to get a specific and new arrangements on the EU arrest warrant. 204 days to get significant or hopefully, you know, I hope that St Munn win the Scottish Premiership. It's unlikely. So in 204 days, do you think you're going to manage to get this in place? I think that we're going to be able to uh, meet the, the, the three um, tranches of uh, the process for leaving the EU. We, we, we negotiated a withdrawal agreement, which is essentially about a um, funding for the the, uh, the funding uh, package as we leave the EU and the rights of citizens. Although, the, as we are well aware, there's, there are issues around uh, Northern Ireland. But on we, justice, Secretary of State, uh, everything we're doing in justice, do you think we can do? But, well, I'm, I'm saying. Well, well but that, what I'm saying is, that, I mean, the, the second Neils. part of that process is to have the implementation period, which is the period that would run from March, a, um, which would run from March 2019 to the end of December 2020. And that's, that, that period is an important period. But international in crime which, will in still which, happen in, which in 204 to, days' in time. In which to take... But with the impl with the implementa under the implementation period, everything as is currently the case would remain the same for that period through to 20. Uh, 20. We would all, the EU and the UK. The, the, there are one or two exceptions, but the EU and the UK would operate on the same basis as we do. And in that period, the future relationship uh, 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 agreements would be uh, concluded. That that's that's the basis on which I'm uh, seeking to uh, achieve, and I, I I believe it is achievable. The Scottish Government had their Scotland's place in Europe, security, judicial cooperation and law enforcement. They produced this as a way to move forward. My concern is that we're in a situation, just in the real world, when I used to work in the real world, uh, Secretary of State, I sold cars. 
Now, negotiation... Okay, Mr. Negotiation, negotiation was simple of I had a price in my head that I wanted the person to pay uh -huh. and they had a price that they wanted to pay. Currently today, uh -huh. Secretary of State, I don't think you know what price you want uh, or, uh, using the same analogy, what price that you're planning to sell. The negotiation is... Nil. We seem to have a situation here where you have specific and new arrangements. It might be a third party arrangement. It might not be. There's nothing tangible. There's nothing solid here. I, I don't uh, uh, agree. We have we set out our uh, in, in in your equivalence our brochure with uh, our uh, model uh, in it in July. That is the outcome uh, that w that we are seeking to achieve. That is what we put uh, on uh, the table and that is what is currently being discussed but has uh, to be with, facts, with, the, with the EU. That the, the time scale and, and the clock is ticking. The time scale means you know, that w within uh, the next few weeks that will all have to come to a head and it will be, it, it will be clear uh, whether we have achieved the outcome uh, that, that, that we set out, but I am confident uh, that we can that we can do that. Thank you. Um, just to check, Michelle, if you covered everything you wanted in the benefit costs. No, um, um, there's one one other area, yeah. so if I could pick that up, because um, obviously one of the one of the key points here, Cabinet Secretary, is that sorry, Secretary of State, there is, there is the geographical proximity. So the closer, closer countries are to each other affects how shared the level and type of threats they face are. Um, so if, if you agree with that uh, as a statement, perhaps you could go into a bit of detail on how that is measured, how it affects Scotland, and how that will then affect the negotiations with the EU. Well, clearly, uh, clearly I mean, geographical uh, proximity it, it, it is very significant, and particularly in relation to the movement uh, of criminals and the uh, and the propensity, um, you know, for them to carry out similar uh, crimes within a uh, similar uh, geographies, and and that, you know, again, you know, you what you what we're coming back to is the benefits not just for us but for uh, EU member states to engage. Uh, in, in cooperation in, in, in relation to these matters. It, you know, we are seeing uh, that g gangs, for example, are operating uh, across uh, countries, across uh, the EU and into the, into the UK. It's to our mutual advantage that we cooperate and work together uh, to tackle those sort of issues. So, in effect... Uh, it is a two-way relationship as opposed to someone who is a long way away from us because if, if we don't work with us, we will both suffer at both ends, which is why ultimately people need to come to the table and will come to the table. I, well, I, I obviously agree with uh, that analysis. I believe, uh, you know, I, I, I believe it is firmly in the interests of, of EU member states to uh, reach an agreement uh, with uh, the UK for many of the reasons uh, that, that we've set out already in this uh, discussion. Thank you. Much. Um, so I, say, I referred earlier to the, um, the, the fact that the UK will be outside the structures and, and obviously one of the key ones in this area is the, the role of the European Court of Justice. And the white paper from the UK government um, made clear that the, the role of the European Court of Justice in the UK will, will come to an end as a result of this, although it also states that um, where there are disputes in areas where the UK has agreed to be part of a common rule book, then, and I quote, there should be the option of a referral to the European Court of Justice for an interpretation. That seems to be somewhat inconsistent, certainly doesn't uh, ring uh, true with the, uh, the, the previous ex expressed opinion about taking back control over our laws. Can maybe help us understand how, how those two things sit together? Well, I think they, sit, they, they, they do um, uh, sit together because, um, as you've indicated, a, a, any reference to a, um, the, the Court of Justice would be made at our, uh, by our choice. So we would have chosen uh, to do that. Uh, we, would, we would have chosen uh, the arrangements uh, that had been put in place uh, th that led to a reference seeming to be uh, ad um, appropriate or uh, desirable. Uh, I mean, what 
uh, we've what we ha what we've made clear though is that the uh, Court of Justice would not have any automatic direct uh, uh, right of involvement uh, in the United Kingdom, but where we are cooperating uh, with uh, other uh, with, or with EU member states uh, in relation to uh, uh, frameworks or arrangements that they've set up, then it may be appropriate to make that uh, to, to make such a reference, and that opportunity would be available. Is that that you would you would choose to make a reference? You wouldn't be uh, required to do it, and, and um, presumably, uh, it, would it stand that you wouldn't be bound by uh, any findings that the, that the court came up with? I mean, it's difficult to to see the, the European Court of Justice, um, or indeed uh, member states uh, of the, the European Union, buying into that sort of model. Well, I, I, I think you know there there are matters clearly in areas where which would be ongoing ongoing if we were part of certain arrangements where the court of justice I would clearly have a, a, um, a, a an expertise if i put it that um, way uh, where all the, where you know all the parties may consider that that was an appropriate um, appropriate reference to make our position has always been clear that there would be no continuing direct uh, role uh, for uh, the Court of Justice, and, and that, that is the case. That is uh, the position that we've taken forward into the uh, negotiations, but that in, some, in areas where there was a, essentially our participation in the European institution, there would be the option uh, for a referral. When you talk about the areas of the common rule book, I mean you're either going to refer it to the to the ECJ or you're or you're not. It doesn't sound terribly discretionary. Otherwise, the the the, the functioning of that common rule book falls apart. It, it, the, the the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice would have to be agreed, and and it wouldn't be up to the UK to decide whether or not, if there was a dispute, that that dispute could only be settled through reference to the ECJ. That would it, have to be automatic. It, well, but it, but it would be further back in that decision-making process by, adopt, uh, by uh, taking forward a provision that could then uh, lead to, to that uh, outcome. That would have been a choice that, we, that would have been a choice uh, that would have been made in taking on uh, that uh, outcome in relation to that aspect of the common rulebook. As I say, it doesn't, it doesn't strike me as, as terribly discretionary. It would need to be agreed up front as part of the terms of the, the common rule book. If there are financial penalties and, 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 and other obligations or sanctions attached to that, then, th then that's not discretion on the part of the, the UK. That's us signing up to, to ECJ um, involvement, oversight and, and jurisdiction in those areas covered by the common rule book. Well, it's, but it, it's the step back that I've just set out. It's, it's, making, that, it's, it's making the decision uh, to be part of that area of the common rule book. That is, a, that, that is a decision for the United Kingdom. It is not a requirement. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rona, I think you've still got some further just, questions. Just briefly, no uh, if I could briefly return to the no deal scenario. Um, which is a distinct possibility. I think we know that, but um, can you? This would obviously have financial implications for Scotland. I'm thinking in terms of border security and, and extra policing, etc. What funding would be made available to Scotland in the event of an ordeal scenario? In, ter in terms of uh, the um, arrangements uh, that. Um, currently uh, exist in relation to EU funding as a, as a, as a specific. Uh, I mean, what the government has guaranteed is that areas of EU funding uh, would, would con that were previously committed uh, would continue. Obviously, in areas uh, in, in areas that that, we're con that we would be considering contingencies, uh, there is a there, there are there is an ongoing uh, dialogue with the Scottish government, the UK government. I mean, obviously, the UK government is responsible for uh, the border the border force as it uh, exists in terms of uh, in that specific in terms of people uh, entering and leaving uh, the United Kingdom. I, uh, I mean, obviously, if the Scottish government uh, felt that it had to make other uh, arrangements in, in relation to any aspect of No Deal, I mean, that that would be. Uh, a, a matter that they would have to uh, consider themselves. That's uh, 
despite the fact that Scotland didn't vote to leave Europe, we would have to bear the cost of possible repercussions of it if there was no deal? Well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think it'll, it, it would probably be the best use of our time to go back through all the arguments about why it was a UK-wide... Uh, we would not receive, you virtually just said we wouldn't receive ex any extra funding if well, we had to put other arrangements in place. Well, we would have to, it would have to be clear what those, you know, what those arrangements are under what, you know, that there are certain uh, uh, arrangements whereby the UK does support a, uh, a, 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 a funding, a, it does support funding police or counter-terrorist activities uh, in Scotland. But, I mean, I'm not aware at this moment of, of a specific identified issue uh, by the Scottish Government in relation to an area uh, of policing that they would require additional funding if we left the EU on the basis of, of no deal. Okay, thank you. Okay. John Finney. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Um, Secretary, I want to go back briefly to, and it's a sort of follow-on from my colleague Liam MacArthur's questions here, to the European arrest warrant, which yes. kicked, kicked this off. And, and I share your, your view that this is a, a commendable piece of legislation that's had significant effect. Indeed, we heard from the Lord Advocate some very uh, uh, clear examples of the benefit to the Scottish legal system. Accepting that you want the retention of the European arrest warrant, but acknowledging that you have discussed contingencies, could you say what the third party or bespoke equivalent of that European arrest warrant would look like? What format would it take? Well, Please. what um, at the moment, uh, if, if, you know, if we can go back to the, um, the, 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 the previous discussion, you know, our focus is on getting the sort of agreement that we want. Now, if it emerges that we are not going to have you know, a deal, we will I um, set out what the, the contingency, uh, our, our contingency arrangements, and indeed the technical uh, and, and these technical notices that I've referenced. So, if we get um, to that point, I, I, you know, again, I'm very happy to um, revert to you. But our efforts are focused in on getting the, the sort of arrangement that, that that I set out in my earlier. Uh, evidence. Uh, thank you. You, 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 you. My colleague George Adam referred to the time frame, and it's a, it's a relatively short time frame. And the reason I ask is because, of course, there are practical implications to this. This isn't some sort of academic exercise. There are ongoing implications regarding existing inquiries and what the ramifications of that could be. Um, there are clearly unless it's, uh, there, it's likely there will have to be transitional arrangements. Are you able to give us reference to other treaties that could be fall back on if they are European arrest warrant? Is there what other format? Because this, this is actually, the, you've quoted the numbers, uh -huh. this is very important. This uh -huh. is about how our criminal justice system yeah. works. It, indeed it is, but there are a whole host of other you know, very, very uh, important issues around uh, leaving the EU. And that's why it's absolutely... Arresting criminals from whom a warrant's been craved, uh, I think, is a very important... Well, issue. it is. But, and, all, and but, also, well, but I, I also think that people having a job and a livelihood is a very important issue. There are a huge number of really significant... I'm not diminishing your question. I'm saying there are a huge number of significant issues about leaving the EU. And that is why the government is committed to leaving the EU on an orderly basis with a deal. And that's what the outcome that we want to achieve. That's what we're focused on uh, doing. I don't want to leave the EU on the basis that, th no. that threatens somebody's job, that yeah. threatens the prospect of criminals being here in the UK that can't be arrested, or criminals being in the EU who can't be arrested. I don't want that outcome. And that's why the focus of our efforts is on getting a deal. I hear that. It's loud and clear, and I, I share that ambition, Secretary State. Mm. But if I ask again, and I, this is the Justice Committee. Yes. And I, I, this is, I mean, I don't want to rehearse the constitutional no, no. arguments or the merits mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the, the outcome. But we need to try and understand the practical implications. Uh -huh. We are going to be speaking to the, se the, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the practical implications. Mm -hmm. So, accepting your aspiration for the continuation of the arrest of warrant, what are the fallback positions? I've, as I've indicated, I'm happy to set that out 
uh, I, I'm happy to set that out at the, when uh, we make, you know, when we put forward uh, our, our uh, position, which we are doing in relation to these various technical notices that are being released in terms of what would happen in the event of, of a no do, deal. Do you envisage the Hague Convention would have some role to play? Well, of course, the, the Hague Convention would certainly uh, uh, have a. Uh, have a role to play. Okay, um, thank you. If, if I may move on to, uh, I have some questions about family law, if, yeah. I, if I may, Secretary of State. And, and we're blessed in the UK and indeed in Scotland and in my own area of, of having a rich mix of nationalities and all sorts of different uh, family relationships. And family law is a very important uh, uh, aspect that needs to be catered for um, um, uh, within the UK's plans uh, to, to remove. And they cover things like uh, the jurisdiction recognition and enforcement, um, you know, which national court can actually decide on issues. Can you give us some background to the work that's been done in relation to that, please? Yes. I mean, we are, a, um, you know, again, as, a, uh, as, as in relation to the, the rest uh, warrant, we are a seek to agree new... Uh, and reciprocal agreements on, on civil judicial cooperation based on the current depth of cooperation that we have, which covers civil, commercial uh, and family matters. And the, as you say, the agreement would need to cover which countries' courts uh, hear a family uh, law case that has cross-border uh, issues with other EU countries and which laws would apply and how judgments could be recognised and enforced. So that is something a, uh, that we recognise, you know, and we recognise the importance of. The, of course, there is a, um, it's a huge the Hague, chunk of work. There is the Hague a, uh, Convention, but a, uh, and we will continue to operate the, the Hague uh, Convention areas where we have uh, signed uh, up. But we want uh, to reach that sort of agreement, and that's what we're again endeavouring to do. What reassurance, of any, can you give to constituents who may be involved in what are protracted and, by their very nature, very involved negotiations across different jurisdictions, the status of, of their cases at this time and in the few months well, that we have left? Well, well the, the first point to make is, obviously, as I said in response to, to Mr Adams' question, you know, the, the, the scenario which we are... Uh, working towards is that there will be an implementation period and that that will operate uh, until uh, 2020 in relation to uh, the continuation of the existing uh, arrangements as we uh, leave a, uh, the EU, which uh, does mean that a number of these, you know, that, that there, is, there is an extended period uh, by which a number of these issues uh, will be uh, developed. But the reissue, what I would want to say to anybody who's currently you know, involved in an ongoing uh, legal uh, matter across uh, jurisdictions is that we want to do you know, nothing that would prejudice your uh, current uh, legal rights, and that was what we will uh, seek to ensure. Secretary of State, would it be possible to come back to the committee, as, as you, you said you would do in relation to the European arrest warrant, ah. with some of the... the the fallback um, elements that would be covering um, family Yes, law indeed. I, I mean, it may be that I would write to the committee, but I would certainly, uh, one, one, once we've set those out, that I would, I would certainly do that. Are you able to give an indication of a time frame for that? Well, what we're again, looking, well, these are very live matters for some individuals. Yeah, well, they, they, they would be, they, they will be in relation to um, civil legal matters, as I indicated in, in some of my earlier evidence. Uh, uh, we would, we will be making a technical notice of. Uh, available relatively soon, and as soon as that is available, I'll let the committee have that, and indeed any other area uh, that we've covered in today's uh, uh, proceedings, or indeed in which I know the committee has an interest, I'm very happy to share those as well. Thank you. Liam? Okay. Be, yeah, just following up from that, Secretary of State, would it be uh, possible to include within that the, uh, the, the approach being taken in relation to commercial law? I mean, obviously, there's a read across in terms of uh, Hague Convention, but um, some clarity about what the, the, the UK government's in, intentions are uh, in relation to how, how the uh, uh, 
uh, how the issues around commercial law would be um, covered in, in, in those scenarios would be helpful too. Yes, I would be very happy to do that, Ms McCann. You know, in this particular area of family law, child law, divorce, all of that, we had a very lengthy session on that, and I think it's fair to say it was very far from straightforward. Even rules within the EU, which um, it was thought were working well, um, in evidence we heard actually weren't working so no. well. So I, I think a, a full analysis of that would be good. But I think we all took some comfort from the... Um, the fact that the Hague Convention seems to be uh, something that is always going to be a fallback provision for most of this kind of work. Before we leave, I can give that. I mean, which I did yeah. for Mr. Finney. I mean, an absolute uh, commitment to adhere yeah. to uh, the, what we signed up uh, under the Hague Convention. Yeah, because it's certainly abduction, divorce, matrimonial property. All of these are very real pro uh, problems for everyone. Certainly, when we had our visit to uh, the House of Commons and we met with the House of Lords committee, they were very exercised about family law and the implications of that. And, and so I think some detailed um, work coming back to the committee explaining how all of that's going to out would be mm -hmm. very much appreciated mm -hmm. in the short time we have available today. I don't think yeah. we could begin to, yeah. to look at that with any um, degree of success. Can I perhaps pressure again, though, um, before we leave the priorities and negotiations, just to explain, I think it would be helpful to the committee just um, how at present um, the UK currently provides uh, the UK with assets or expertise or the kind of capabilities because what we do just now seems to me important to assessing the value that the EU will see in the cooperation that's going forward just now. Is that just in, in terms in how, of how, how things currently work with the EU? Personnel. I, I, in the area of criminal, uh -huh. uh, civil, well, uh, whatever, uh, uh, policing. I, I, that, that's a matter in which I, could, I, I would probably be better if I did um, write to you in terms, just as we've, I think uh, Ms Mackay asked in relation to Scotland, uh, uh, we could write, we, I can write to you in relation to the, you know, the UK contribution overall to these various um, EU bodies and initiatives. I'm very happy to do yeah. that. Because uh, we do have a close partnership just now. If we examined that more fully or got more details on that, that would be very helpful to the committee. Now we're moving on to our second kind of theme, Morris. No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon, Secretary of State. Um, in relation to discussions with devolved administrations, can you give me some idea of what the current level of dialogue is between the ministers, officials in the Scottish and UK governments, uh, particularly in relation to the policing and criminal and civil justice matters? There's always um, ongoing a, you know, dialogue on these very... Um, you know, on, on these... Uh, uh, matters and the UK government uh, you know, is closely works closely with with the Scottish government. I uh, so that uh, yesterday uh, the first minister was able to have a full briefing on uh, the issues uh, around uh, the identification of the two uh, Russians who were uh, involved in uh, the incident in uh, Salisbury. We want to work closely with the Scottish Government uh, and uh, Police Scotland and the other agencies here on uh, these matters. It's very, very important uh, that we do so. Uh, in relation to um, the discussions about uh, leaving the EU, you'll be aware that Mr Michael Russell is the uh, principal point man, if I, want to, if I can use that expression, uh, in relation to uh, discussions with, with the United Kingdom uh, government in relation to uh, the negotiations. So, uh, and the way that operates is through the, um, it's, it's through the uh, Joint Ministerial uh, Committee for uh, uh, exiting the, the EU. We do have uh, uh, we have established uh, in recent uh, months a ministerial forum, and that is a basis whereby other ministers can uh, engage from uh, Scottish and uh, Welsh governments uh, with the UK governments. That's headed up by my uh, colleague Chloe Smith from the uh, Cabinet Office and Robin Walker uh, from DEXU. And as I understand it, that forum has either has or it is intended uh, we'll have a discussion of justice issues specifically. 
been uh, producing some very reasonable discussions in the forum. Uh, so Indeed, uh, discussions within the forum have taken place on a very uh, constructive basis. What sort of things have they been discussing in particular? Well, well they've been discussing some of the issues that, that we've uh, touched on uh, today and how you know the outcomes that we want to uh, achieve. I mean, obviously, um, Scottish uh, ministers rightly and the Lord Advocate uh, make clear, as I do, mm -hmm. Scottish Scotland's distinct uh, civil and criminal legal uh, system, which is a very important part of, to be uh, recognised within the negotiations and discussions. But there are, num you know, there, there are a number of other um, you know, serious issues that are uh, under discussion. Thank you. Okay, um, Michelle. Common frameworks, just a little bit more. All right, you, I didn't know you put me down for that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Got caught on the hop there. Um, yeah, it really want to just explore how the common frameworks in the area of justice are being developed. Um, so, what areas of justice policy are likely to be covered by common frameworks, and what discussions are taking place between the UK and the Scottish governments in relation to justice policy post Brexit, um, and. Can you envisage or can you give us some idea of how, how will Scotland's separate justice system be respected within that system? The point I'd start is that you know, Scotland's separate justice system is already respected within mm -hmm. the system and, and, and that's not going um, to change. Uh, just, the area of justice is not going to be subject to a legislative uh, framework because, uh, you know, because of that. Uh, different uh, legal uh, system that that that, that currently uh, operates. Now, clearly, uh, it uh, is desirable to have consistencies across the United Kingdom in relation to, for example, recognising uh, you know a divorce in an EU member state. It's desirable that the arrangements, I think, in Scotland, uh, uh, England, and Wales uh, are the same. But it's not essential, uh, and that's the basis which we've proceeded uh, with our distinct Scottish legal system over, over many uh, years. So what we would hope to, what we would hope, uh, to achieve in a number of areas is agreement uh, that we can uh, operate uh, on a similar basis across either Great Britain or the, or the United Kingdom, but there won't be – justice is, is an area where there will not be a single uh, or, or in, in, in a legislative, legislative uh, framework as such. What we would seek to do is essentially, in many cases, build on existing uh, agreements that are in place. So fundamentally, the cooperation we currently have in place and the way in which it works, which seems on the whole to work fairly smoothly, you would envisage that moving I would forward envisage, in much the I, same way? I would, in, I would envisage building on that existing uh, cooperation. Okay. And therefore, the transfer, you know, if, if there is a distinct change to the relationship with the EU in terms of how we um, cooperate from a justice point of view, will you build into that any differences that exist in our legislative systems? So, or will it be a question of making an arrangement and then we'll have to fit in behind that? No, I mean, any, arra any, mm -hmm. any arrangement that was made between the, the United, on these matters, made, uh, sort of matters would be made by the United Kingdom and the EU uh, would be done on the basis of, of agreement within the United Kingdom. Right, so it'll be properly taken. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, in the white paper it talks about health security and at first glance I'm thinking, well, that's maybe nothing to do with uh, justice or security. But then when we think of the cyber attacks that um, I know in Lanarkshire Health Board, you know, there were, there were um, issues there. Could you perhaps um, give the committee a little bit more um, information on, on on how that would kind of um, fit into the justice and um, security aspect of things. You're right. I mean, health security is about uh, the protection of public health mm -hmm. from initiatives to uh, you know, cause uh, you know, cause widespread uh, public your know, public harm, and uh, so that that's what it's about. It's about uh, cooperating 
in relation to uh, the, the, the potential threat that, that somebody or some third uh, a party uh, would seek to cause uh, damage to, to widespread public, uh, you know, public health by the releasing of uh, um, nerve agents, toxins, uh, whatever, and you know the, the reality is that that's as possible in Glasgow as it is uh, in London. Uh, you know the event that we've, we, you know, we've uh, been discussing earlier took place in a relatively, uh, you know, a, a relatively a, um, a small a, um, city. So th these events could take place anywhere. And what we are committed to doing is to obviously to work with both the NHS and uh, NHS Scotland and uh, with uh, a Police Scotland and, and the various counter terror um, agencies to ensure that you know inside or outside the EU uh, we're as well placed to counter these as possible. I think it gives the committee some comfort that these areas are being actively looked at and it's very much on, on the agenda. And there is um, a, f a group, uh, the, the, the representatives from the four health services within the United Kingdom uh, do meet together on, on a regular basis, with which obviously a number of operational issues they would consider, but this is the sort of issue they would also look at as well. Yeah. Again, that's very um, heartening. Michelle. Just slightly down that same vein, um, I was just thinking about the security agencies themselves. While all these negotiations are taking place at a political level, um, and we talk about how the 27 member states feel, how the Commission feels, how our governments feel, but what about the security agencies themselves? Have we had any sort of feedback from them? Because obviously they've built up these systems, they work internally with each other, um, and not just within the EU, but across the world. So, you know, where is their voice in, in all of this? Are they giving clear messages in terms of what they expect and hope that countries will do? I think they do. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they do give clear messages, and the clear message that they want is to see the maximum amount of cooperation between, uh, between countries in relation to tackling these issues, because, you know, we're talking about a European context. Many of these issues are a global nature. Mm -hmm. And is their voice being, do you think, in terms of overall, their voice is, is being listened to by all the member states, by ourselves, by the Commission? I certainly think that we place ex very significant weight on what our security services would say and do. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Prime Minister chairs the National um, Security Council, which is one of the uh, uh, or, um, uh, government uh, bodies, but uh, I know uh, that, that she personally places enormous weight on the advice that she gets from the security services, and I'm sure that's the case in other countries. Thank you. That concludes our um, line of questioning, Cabinet Secretary. Can I, uh, Secretary of State, um, can I thank you again for your time? It's been much appreciated that we've been able to go into um, some of these issues in detail, and we look forward to the additional information that you've promised the committee. I'll be very happy to provide that when it's available. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Our next meeting will be on the morning of Tuesday, 11 September, where the committee will hold a similar session to today's with the Scottish Government's new Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Lord Advocate. And with that, uh, I formally um, close this 21st meeting of the Justice Committee.